This is the Women Emerging Expedition Podcast, so you can follow the ups and downs and the roundabouts of the expedition and play your part in them. 24 women started on the 28th of May 2022 on this virtual expedition that will take nine months. We are women from across the world determined to find an approach to leadership that resonates with women. We'll be successful so that women the world over will be able to say, if that's leadership, I'm in. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Julia Middleton here, Expedition Leader. This episode is about leading fights. I think it is fascinating that it is slightly different, like all leadership, but um, there's some very strong messages. And I've spoken to two women that I find very compelling on the subject, Leila Toplik um, and Julienne Lucet. Leila, whose story... Um, started as a desperate refugee from a war-torn country and who became a fighter for refugees uh, and, and spent her whole life so far and no doubt continuing to fight on many, many fronts at the moment, uh, very much as on the uses of AI and, 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 and how that will influence and affect the world. So she she's operating on a bigger and bigger stage but for the purposes of this episode, we're simply going back to her days as a leader in the refugee world. And then Julienne, who has fought a lifelong fight on behalf of women in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I met Julienne through um, the Aurora Prize, something that I've been involved in, and a, a prize given every year from, from Armenia, which recognises extraordinary humanitarians who have worked... Uh, for the most destitute in the world. And she she's brought justice to, uh, I mean, hundreds of uh, perpetrators of violent war crimes over the years. She is, again, a remarkable fighter. So they both have so much to say, but I, I tried to pull it to, at least to start with, two of the really, really strong messages. Layla first on, I think there's no other way to summarise this, but the word hope, that as a leader in a fight, you need to remember that you cannot lead with despair. You have to lead with hope. And then Julienne, who must over the years have been tempted to give up so many, many times to walk away and and to leave the fire burning because she must have felt that it was burning her up. But Julienne's message is so much that you must never lose touch with the people that you are whom you are fighting for. And and it's when you do lose touch that you begin to run out of energy. So let's start this episode first by talking to Layla. First and foremost, about hope. One of the key things for me has been that to lead a fight in this case is to be optimistic about the future. And this is also in the context of really some thorny and oftentimes personal problems. So, for example, refugees, having been a refugee myself. So the the kind of the first thing for me has been to choose what problem to focus on, uh, what problem to me is worth fighting for. Um, then to really be clear about what energy I want to bring to this fight. And I think energy for me has become synonymous with hope, with instilling hope. being for sure, angry about inequality and, and devastation, but really channeling that into determination and optimism that the future could be better if we all, if I try and the people that I work with, if we all try. 
And choosing intentionally not to despair, instilling hope and trust that change is possible is to me synonymous to leading a fight worth fighting. And you have the right to say that, don't you? Because you have had moments of real despair where it would have been perfectly rational for you to have been despairing. That's right. Having um, grown up pretty much during a a war, um, been a refugee, and then also um, very quickly transitioned or transformed that despair and anger into helping others as a as a 18 year old teacher of refugees and really realizing that despair is and and um, absence of hope can lead to apathy and at the same time is a luxury because people who are facing these struggles, whether it's displacement, um, loss of loved ones, uh, poverty, um, natural disasters, they can't afford to lose hope. Neither should we. And that is also, I mean, one, one thing that is also important is when you're leading a fight, when you're working a problem, um, the starting point is to believe, is not, not, not necessarily to know what is needed to lead that fight or what the outcome should look like, but to believe that you will figure it out along the way. If you're leading a group of people, and the truth is that in your heart you're despairing, very often you don't reveal that. You Mm. reveal the hope, even though just at the moment I don't feel particularly hopeful. More time, more more often than not, yes, it is about potentially as a leader um, being hopeful, even when you are not. And I think there are also the degrees of hope because I don't think you're ever hundred percent hopeful, especially when you are fighting a really working on a very challenging problem, fighting a very difficult fight. So it's also just recognizing there's always kernel of hope. That's why you're there. Because if you're not, if you're hopeless, you are apathetic to the cause and you are, you're checked out. So it's really drawing on that what's already there. It might be, you know, just 2% versus 98% at, at times. Um, but it goes back to, what are you trying to, what do you need to achieve? Who are you talking to? And sometimes it is important to bring in this, like the the evidence of things just being bad and um, lack of progress in certain areas, but also think about what is the next point in that story and how do you both acknowledge, um, because we can't just swipe that under a carpet, how do you acknowledge where the progress is not being made, where the barriers are still strong and, and are challenging uh, to, re- uh, it's challenged to remove them, but also um, transition to, and bring in kind of in the next step, in the next part of the conversation, what do we do about this? What else can we try? Um, who else do we need to bring to the table? So it is important to be also intentional about finding these daily kind of sources, moments of hope. And also not limiting that to these massive things, but like small things, which is where actually the uh, nature, getting out in nature really helps because small things really inspire awe and, and, and wonder. And I think those are important to sustain the hope and optimism on like an ongoing basis. Sometimes also that infusion of hope comes from others because to lead a fight is not to be the only person that has optimism and hope. It is to, through the process, to instill hope in others so they can continue fueling whatever is being worked on together. And that's the part where it's not a alone and lonely journey it is something that you do with others so to hold this hope 
you have to look after yourself. And you used an expression to me of intentional self-care. I learned that the hard way because there were a couple of times in my past when I was, I took care for myself as optional, as, you know, secondary to the other priorities and that didn't end really well. So I, and I, I know from, from friends that I'm not the only one who's learned the hard way to really place this intentionality and not seasonal, not occasional, not on my birthday, but like really daily intentionality on self-care and to be mindful of what does self-care mean to me? And that's also evolved over time. But I think a couple of things that have really stayed true is these moments of brief reflection. And I have a journal that I use and literally sometimes like it's just three sentences, but it is that, you know, a couple of moments of pausing and then conserving energy, finding time, like, because 12 months or 365 days is a long time. So you can't be at the same level of energy every day and every minute. And really also being thoughtful about how do you go through these uh, almost seasons of different expansion of energy and contraction where you nurture yourself. And so you can give what you want to give to the fights you're fighting. And when you do it, do you not feel guilty or self-indulgent? Or... Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It, it, because you're, you're not, I've learned that I'm not useful to others and to the cause if I'm not where I need to be mentally and physically to do what. I believe needs to be done. And um, I think it's really important to, as they say on the airplanes, to put your oxygen mask on first and then um, help others around you. I think that's, that's, a, that's again, that's the mistake that I made um, in the past. That's the mistake that I see others make. And at, at the end of the day, it hurts them and it hurts the work um, that they're doing. I remember um, my colleagues once did a skit of me as a leader. And <laughs> there was this, they would laugh about the fact that they would look up at me and I would have my feet up on my desk and I would be dreaming. <laughs> and I always used to think that the skit was an insult and then I realised it was a compliment. <laughs> Absolutely. You were, you, you were doing what you needed to do in order to be your like bring to the world what you wanted to bring and I, I think that's so, also an important part but also yeah. to see wood from the trees because if you don't yeah. your only legitimacy as a leader is that you can see the whole picture and if you get too tired you can't see it absolutely thank you so so much Leila now we we move to Julienne whose whose story well really her point is illustrated by a really beautiful story she told me i've asked her to tell you this story see what you think one day i decide i say to my husband and say now i think that i need to stop because nothing has happened no result no success, no change effort. I say no change is coming. Why we continue to, to fight every day? Now I'm tired. And all, all my family look me and they say, mm, okay, we'll see. But one day after, I hear that my, uh, my brother, he uh, died in in Mombasa. Mombasa is uh, for uh, is a uh, one territory of Ituri. 
I was in Kinshasa. But I take my fly with my husband and went there, went in Bunia. And after that, we take the car to go in Mombasa. And when we got uh, on our run, uh, our, our road, on our, your way. Road, why, why? Yeah. And we, I see women with police. The police uh, is, uh, I don't know how I, I can say, of address, course, eh? ag, ag, address eh? les femmes. Mm -hmm. And I asked my driver to say, can you stop, please? And he stopped. And my husband asked me, what is happened? And I said to him, can you see uh, outside? The police is a uh, uh, is a uh, aggressive femme. Right, but is being and, aggressive with the women. Yep. Yes, and uh, we stop, and uh, I, I go outside and ask the women what is happened, and they explain to me that the, the this police arrest the husband because the pygmy rape women when they go to the field. And he, he, he didn't uh, arrest the pygmy, but he, he, arre he arrest uh, husband of the victim. And they ask why he, he do that. Now he ask, he say them, he ask them money. And I say, you commander of the police, can you explain to me what, is the, uh, what the lawyer say? You know that you cannot do that. You need to stop the preparators and send him to the judge. You cannot arrest the husband. And I called the uh, prosecutor what? from uh, who was in Beni, in Bunia, and tell him the story. And he asked the police to send immediately the pygmy in Bunia, the, uh, the case in Bunia, and to to leave the husband from the, the, the prison and uh, let women go. And when I come back to the car, in the car, my husband say, ah, you start again? Because you say uh, last day that <laughs> you stop, you cannot continue to fight. And I say, hmm, can you think that I can just leave this situation and go. When I saw women in this situation, I need to stop and ask and do what I can. <laughs> and he just, he just uh, uh, say, okay, okay, let's continue now. Can we continue? I say, we, yes, we continue. We can continue now. I, I have the solution <laughs> and we continue. Julian, the the reason why that story meant so much to me is because in some of the fights I have fought, I get so caught up in the fight that I forget to go and spend enough time with the people I'm fighting for. And if you don't spend enough time with the people you're fighting for, you sort of forget and you begin to get tired. But you don't get tired if you spend enough time with them. Yes, I spend more time with, with them. I live with them. I coming from those community. And every day I saw them, I meet them. Some of them call me on the phone. Some of them come to me in the office. And I went to the village and meet them, speak to them, stay with them. Sometimes we 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 uh, we eat with them, so they are part of my life. When I meet them, I have energy because some of them they tell me story. Some story is very painful, but some of the story is also uh, give me happy. Thank you, Julienne. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, 
I'm going to go, I'm going to go back a bit. I'm going to go back again now to, to Layla. Because as you can imagine, there's so much advice that she could give us about leading a fight. But um, what I wanted to go back to her and talk about is, 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 is this journey of leading a fight. There must almost certainly have been some dead ends that you have walked into, come across, avoided. Um, and, and one of them, I wondered, is, is one of them, Layla, a dead end I've certainly ex- felt, is that you find yourself charging ahead in a fight and you realise after a while that actually it wasn't your fight and that it's not the right fight and that you're not the right leader for it. And I was really interested in whether Layla had ever felt this. And I asked her about when you can and when you can't and whether it's ever possible to walk away from a fight. So basically, this is about the dead ends. That is absolutely correct, Julia. And that goes back to two things that we talked about earlier. One is being very thoughtful. I mean, with as much, obviously, information and, and that you have about what problems you choose to work on and why. And second, this intentionality about reflection along the way. So you don't go get that far in the fight where it's no longer your fight. You wake up to that no longer being your your fight. But it's okay to step away. I mean, that's also, there are, there are natural points in time when you step away. You step away maybe because you're no longer the right person to lead the fight. Um, you step away because the fight has evolved to its, kind of where it needs to be and it's no longer the fight that you want to fight. Um, You step away because there are other pressing problems that you are more excited about. You step away for personal reasons. Or don't you, have you never found the thing that you wanted to step away, but actually you simply could not because of the people around you who would then lose hope? Yes, but that is not um, potentially the wisest reason to stay in the fight. It is about creating then the bridge to where the hope is retained, but that may be fueled by somebody else. And it's also an opportunity in many cases to allow for different voices should I say, even younger voices to come in and shape that fight because some of the fights are just um, age-old fights that we need to, that are beyond, um, because again, we're work- working on some of the some of the massive problems that have been around uh, sometimes for centuries. So it, it is, again, it's not, the hope is not, it is your, my job is to lead the fight um, in like in a, in a way that instills hope and trust, not necessarily to be a, the the leader that equals that hope and trust. I suppose the other dead end is that you get caught up in your own anger. That's quite possible, but um, anger is a fuel for something else, and you can transform that fuel into um, determination into uh, specific type of actions that you take. Um, so it's not the purpose, it is to get you to something that is more useful and practical than um, a raw anger. Have you ever found yourself, I don't know, I have, where you you think you're leading something, but actually, mostly you're raising money. <laughs> that yeah, that is a 
That is a that is certainly a challenge with um, again some of the fights that need to be fought or are being fought today is being able to have the resources to actually do it at the scale and the urgency that it requires. So part of that is again that intentionality around like how do you not end up in that place and how do you make sure that you retain also proximity to the problem that you're working on and um, not lose your story, not lose um, kind of going back to that narrative, narrative that is also grounded in, in what's happening at the point of action, which is where the problem exists. Um, but that comes and back where, to where bringing other people and in. And where your legitimacy lies. That's right. Authenticity, legitimacy. Um, also the kind of sort of North Star. Where do you need to go next? Because also problems and context evolve too. And, you know, where you started, let's say five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago, is going to be different to where you are today. Um so, but this comes back to, again, not being the only one, but working with others and ensuring that pretty much everybody, not just the leader, has that proximity to um, the space, the place, and mostly to the people that um, are struggling with, with that problem. Leila, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I want to get back to Julien as well. And I know it's I'm going back with a slightly weird question. But to me, you know, Julien did share that story. And, um, and I don't know if you felt it, but that story has lots of people mentioned in it. But one of the really key people mentioned in it is her husband. And um, he has a quiet and a backseat role, but there's no doubt there's a very strong place for him in that story. And and when Layla used the expression a North Star, it sort of, I wondered about um, the loneliness of fighting and how important Julien felt having the right partner and in her case, the right husband uh, at her side, how important that is and was and continues to be. If you're going to be a fighter, you need to choose the right man to marry, don't you? Yes, yes. If not, he will just put you out because I know many of us feminists activists, many of us, they, they, they didn't live more with the husband because the husband didn't accept. But if he understands your work, in, if you explain to him what you do, he can understand and he can support you. So you can have energy and you can be uh, strong to continue. And even if my children, they support me, they help me. Uh, they try to understand what I, I say, what I do. And uh, when I'm very, can you sweet triste? They, when you're they come to me. Uh, in uh, in 2008 when i have uh, i was uh, like tra- I, I was tra- traumatized because uh, uh, after to to do investigation in ituri and when militia come again to attack me in beni i je me culpabilize i say myself that oh it's I my give- fault yeah, you yeah, said it's, it's my, my fault. fault. It's my fault. It's, yeah, it's my fault. We lost everything every time, and uh, someday we can they can kill the family. And my husband and all children come to me and say, "No, no, no. 
you do a good job because you facilitate justice for women. We need to support you, even if the situation, even if uh, what they can do will support you. And every time, every evening, every time, when I say, I stay my alone, alone, they, 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 say, they come to me and say, oh, we need that, we need to, to show a movie. And they put, uh, I don't know if you know that, uh, the comedy of uh, Louis de Finesse. I don't know right. if you know. Right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. A silly yes. film. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and they put that. And we, we, we laugh all, all time. And I forgot this situation. And we, we, we start and uh, talk in the family and uh, have some good moments. And uh, I, uh, this uh, situation passes. It passes. How do you yes. choose the right? How do you choose the right husband? Ah, I don't know how. God give me, and God give him also, because sometimes I say, "Oh, you are just to give to have me," and he said to me, "Oh, I think you are just to have to 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 have me." <laughs> So, and you've been married, if I remember rightly, you, Julien, see, see, <laughs> 41, is it 41 years you were married? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I, I salute you. Maybe I'm just going to carry on with this n- nipping backwards and forwards to um, Julien and Leila because they agree on so many things and, 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 not on everything, but on so on many, so on many, many things. But I thought maybe the last word on this episode needed to be back with them. And um, so I went back to Layla and asked her, asked her the question that certainly was in my head and, and maybe indeed in your heads. Do you think fighting is now so much in your DNA, Leila, that you'll die if you stop fighting? I I haven't thought of that, but now that you put it in that way, I would I, I would agree with that. Was there an age that you were at when you were four or seven or eight or ten or eleven where you weren't fighting? Now that I think about it, I think it, it was really before before the war when that was up until the age of 14 or 15 where I might have been fighting but I didn't have that intentionality about it where the intentionality uh, really appeared was during hardship and then my first intentionality or my first fight was related to education and learning and the right to learn and that's also potentially when I recognize the importance of having something to believe in. And again, not necessarily knowing how I'm going to do it, but like having something, a problem I want to solve, something that I believe in and something that I have hope about and just getting started one step at a time. The final word has to go to Julien. Here it goes. In our country, as women, you cannot say, no, I cannot fight. Because if you not fight, you will have the same situation and you will be responsible to the situation in the future. I have nothing to add to what they have said. Just to remind myself, I've got it up. Both Leila and Julien have made it onto my fridge, my increasingly cluttered fridge, because I've been doing what well, this is podcast thirty six. My 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 fridge is absolutely covered in these quotes, little magnets holding them together. But um, both Leila and Julien have made it onto my fridge. Leila with hope, that big word, hope. 
and Julien with those great words just remember who you're fighting for look forward to the next episode lots of love Julia to become part of our movement and share your thinking with us subscribe to the podcast and join the women emerging group on our website at womenemerging.org we love all of the messages you send us keep them coming